Well, because of the winter storm and the ice that's coming in uh, to the area in the next few hours, uh, we're on cyberspace again. So, hello. Uh, Wednesday service has been canceled at Union Hill. So, uh, if you would join me in turning to two verses of Scripture tonight, and that is Acts chapter 17, verse 28. Uh, Acts 17, verse 28. In God, we live and move and have our being. And the concept there is that there is nothing in this life that doesn't have to do with God. There is no part of life. That doesn't have to do with God. There's nothing that God doesn't have his hand creating or sustaining or defining. So everything has to do with God. Uh, the second verse is 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. The last part of that verse is that we take every thought captive to obey Christ. Every thought. Now, within that phrase, there is an implied struggle within our minds to take every thought captive. Because have you ever noticed that when you try to catch or capture something that there's this tug of war between where you want it to go and where it wants to go? When you hook a fish, say you hook a 50 pound catfish or a five pound bass or a big old crappie or a shark in the ocean, those are always fun. Uh, what happens to the end of that pole? And what happens to the fishing line? Well, the fish tugs and it's at war with whatever your direction you're trying to take it. And you're pulling to try to take it captive and it's going the other direction. And, and when we're tasked to catch all the fish in the river of our brain and take them captive to Christ, it takes a long time and a lot of work and effort. And that can describe what's going on with our thoughts, what we think, what we choose, how we decide, you know, the, the whole thought process that we have. There's just inner tug of war when you know that you're supposed to be trying to reel in these thoughts towards Christ and you're wanting to get those thoughts captive in obedience to Christ. And sometimes it's kind of like the reality TV fishing shows where there's this fish that's on the line for hours and the person's drenched in sweat and there's this battle to reel in this fish because there's a tug of war. And even though you are committed in your faith and you have believed and confessed, you're baptized, you've obeyed the gospel, you've come to Christ, yet there's often this inner tug of war between what we have committed ourselves to, being a Christian and living our faith and being a disciple, with what that means and looks like in school and in work life and in family life and taking those thoughts captive as well and bringing them to obedience to Christ. Then it becomes increasingly difficult to keep fishing out all those thoughts in our mind and taking them captive. I'll give you another example. When you get out in the world and you settle down at a job or you go through years of school, there are oftentimes isn't any mention of Christianity in those environments. There's not a whole lot of mention of God in those uh, in those atmospheres, those areas of life. And a lot of people that you're going to be surrounded with don't share the same faith in Christ that you do. And since we're around those people for a lot of our waking hours in this life, a large part of our life seems to be sealed off from the faith that we say matters the most. And we start really examining, you know, you start looking back over your life and you start dissecting the minutes and the hours of the week and you ask the question during all of those things that you go back over and you flip through, where is God showing up in my life outside of church? And when we really start to sit down and examine, what we find is that it's almost like we're adding church activities to Sunday or Wednesday and adding those activities to a completely secular, worldly, material, non-religious rest of the week. So we think about God on Sunday, we pray on Sunday, we worship on Sunday, we open the Bible on Sunday. But the hunger and thirst uh, after righteousness kind of dies down and we turn the religious and faith-filled spigot down to a trickle or completely off until the next Sunday and then, or the next one, the next time we come together with Christians. And it's like we find ourselves in two separate worlds with two separate minds. And we just commute and travel between the private world of our faith or family and church where we feel we can express that faith freely and openly. And then over here, we have the public world, which we suppress our faith and muffle it and censor it. That's a good word that's going on today. Uh, we withhold our private faith from the public world so that our private faith is not seen in our jobs or friendships and our open discussions with others. There are a lot of Christians, and I still struggle with this too, as well. You struggle with defining what it means to have a Christian biblical perspective when you're at school, when you're at your secular job. And we know, you know, when it comes to those environments, it's like, well, I'm a Christian, I shouldn't steal. You know, I'm a Christian, I shouldn't cheat or uh, I shouldn't lie. And we know that we should choose to make right ethical decisions about things in those atmospheres. But beyond that, uh, the workplace or, you know, where we go to, 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 to work in that environment 
it just is a place where we get a paycheck and or in school we just work to get a grade so we can get a diploma or we're making the stepping stone toward a better career because of this job or I'm building a reputation so I can get hired to my dream job and and what what we examine and find out is that a lot of our secular life <laughs> that has to do with our jobs and 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 whatnot has nothing to do with our faith so we're not fishing and capturing every thought uh, just the ones that affect my private life, not my, my public vocation. So to go back to the example of catching big fish, it's like we come to the edge of the water without a pole, without bait, without anything. And that's like when we go to school or work and we just sit at the water's edge. There's no thoughts being taken captive. There's no movement attributed to God. There's no you know spiritual language being used. And we let whatever happened happen and we go back home. We you know, talk about what everybody else is talking about. We don't ever bring up anything that has to do with, you know, the religious aspect of life. And when that is the case, it doesn't take long to feel the strength of your faith becoming weaker and weaker when we shed our deepest beliefs in God along the way as we go to school and we shed that religious language and we shed that religious conversation and religious conviction that we have on Sunday or we commute uh, to work and never let our faith be seen or heard, and we just function in those environments from a purely non-religious, non-faith-based mindset. And when we start to see school and work as this religion-free zone where no one needs to know or see my convictions or hear my spiritual language, or and the religious stuff is just when we get back home or just when we're going to church on Sundays or in the car to church on Wednesdays, you know, our lives become very splintered and fragmented. Work and school become stripped of any spiritual significance throughout the week. And I'm no longer able to be identified as a Christian outside of me walking into the church doors and taking the Lord's Supper every Sunday. And the spiritual truths that we say have very deep meaning to us and that we you know, know are gods and that we love them and, and, and that we believe them, we believe the Bible and we sing, oh, I love Jesus, uh, those become like a leisure weekend activity that we do when we have time off. And then we just get back into the world. We fish for those thoughts to take captive on the weekends, but we lay the pull down when we get back into the work week, into the school week. And every work, every activity that people do, the life that you live at school, the life that you live at work, can be used to point towards God. There are biblical principles that apply to every part of your life, not just the part when you come together on Sundays or Wednesdays or when you get home. Uh, we have to get to a point where we can relate and connect to God in every dimension of our lives. Everywhere that we live and move and have our being, every day that we live and move, and every life and movement that we make at school or at our job, just like Acts 17 verse 28 says. God doesn't just tell you how to live and move at church and live and move around other Christians. God has to become the voice that tells you how to live and move and speak at school and speak at work and speak at every other movement in life. It's no longer about just getting a paycheck and it's no longer about just going to school and getting a diploma and then making a living. It's that the movement that you go through every day is a movement that is led towards God and leads others towards God. It's the very thoughts that you have every day are being taken captive by your, your faith in Christ and obedience to Him. There's a song that I sang a couple of weeks ago called Just For Today uh, at Union Hill. It's been around for a long time. First time I heard it was in my uh, late teens, early 20s. So a long time ago. And I remember a, a phrase in that song that led some people to say that we shouldn't sing it. And the chorus is what everybody got up in arms about. And it said, may my steps be worship, may my thoughts be praise. And there was literally a debate that was going on uh, mostly in uber conservative churches that said that all of life was not worship, so we shouldn't sing that song. And that worship only happened if you were singing or praying or sitting there in a church service uh, when one of the five acts of worship were present, you know, you put your hand up five acts of worship. So with some churches, it became like a red stamp, you not know, sing kind of song because they were literally saying there was a secular part of your life uh, over here and a spiritual part of your life over here, and they were split. Hmm. But if the church is going to be serious about discipleship, then we have to teach Christians how to keep living for God after they walk out of the church doors and after they walk out of their house and after they leave that, let's say, a prayer supper table of your house. Every Christian who works 
anywhere in business, every Christian who does factory work, in the medical field, every Christian who goes to school, they're on the front lines of the engagement with the world. Every Christian who goes out into the world is a, a, a soldier in a spiritual battle. And the church and Bible classes and preaching and get-togethers and fellowships, they're training grounds for sending people out to be equipped to speak the gospel and show the gospel to the rest of the world and to be able to catch those thoughts that don't belong, to take captive every thought in obedience to Christ. So in a sense, we have become fluent in two languages, all right? Uh, the language of the gospel uh, and the language of the world. We have all been taught to use the language of the world. If you've gone through any form of public schooling and ridden the school bus to, to school, then you know the language of the world very well. You know the language of the world through textbooks and literature and writing papers and sitting through lectures, and you become very familiar with the way the world tries to make sense uh, of the world without God in it. And you know the language of evolution and their version of cultural ethics that the world uses all the time. And the problem becomes that we, for an hour or two a week or for a few minutes a week, use the language of the Bible and use the language of God. And for the rest of the week, we just use the same words and language and even logic sometimes as everyone else around us. And the uncomfortable truth is that it becomes easier to speak the language of the world than it is to struggle with translating that language into God's language. We, we sometimes don't do a very good job with, uh, with being bilingual, with being you know, some people who can speak two languages, because it's way more comfortable to just use the language of the world and not gospel language when it comes to God. It's easier to just sit on the shore and not fight with the fish that you have on a hook and just sit there. There's a story I was reading about a, a professor at Cornell University. It's in Ithaca, New York who was very concerned about the, the Christian students in his class. The professor was a Christian, and throughout the semester, he would listen to his students talk after class when they were leaving, and he, he only found out that they were fellow believers when the class was over, and they would find other fellow believers to talk to, and they would use you know Christian language with these people. And he was amazed what he found out about this class by the end of the term, that a large portion of them would be what you would call church-going Christians, but they wouldn't even open their mouth and say anything about it in class, even when it was a biblically-leaning question. Most of the class didn't know how to express their faith and convictions in the public realm of life. It was only after class, in private, that they felt that they could. When the class was over, they could speak the language of the Bible, speak Christian language, but not during the public discussions. Poll after poll done by Barna and Rainer Research Institute and other research groups show that a large percentage of people in this country believe in God, and yet when asked that they would declare it publicly, the percentage drops considerably. To give an example of this, uh, back in 1994, when I was a sophomore in high school, uh, it was said that 65% of Americans thought that religion and religious views were losing their influence in the public sphere. 65% said that religion was losing influence in the public sphere in 1994. 62% said that the influence of religion was increasing in their personal lives, their private lives. That was almost 30 years ago, and it has now happened. There's this huge divide between what we privately believe and privately are dedicated to and privately are committed to, but then there's this split between that private area of our lives and the public viewing of your faith. So there's this huge divide between what we privately believe and what we publicly live. And it's easier to do that. I get it. It's easier to sit at the edge of the water than it is to struggle with a fish, to capture all these fish that are swimming around in your mind, and to, to actually talk to other people about the fish that you're capturing. You know, It's easier to enjoy the private idea of faith that is walled up safely you know, from the real world, and it's easier to just speak like everyone else speaks because... When you speak a different language than other people, people tend to look at you funny. And it's easier to let the world look at your faith in Christ as something that's downgraded and demoted to the level of our private lives and it doesn't have to affect anyone in the public eye. But that's not Acts 17 and verse 28. That in God we live and move and have our being. That's not 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5, that we capture every thought and make it obedience to Christ. Christianity is a lens through which you and I are to interpret and see the whole of reality. So I ask this question every time we get done with class. So I'll ask you, how do you see this practically, practically being applied to your life? Where do you see that there is this divide between what you privately are committed to and what you're privately dedicated to 
and this disconnect from what you should be publicly dedicated to and publicly committed to. And is the language different that you use when it comes to your private life than when it comes to your public life? And what is it that you can do to grow closer together to God? Because God is ruler over all of those things, not just one part. 